You know, I thought it was hard going first, but I think it's a lot harder going last. So I sympathize with you, Jeff, from yesterday. Uh, as, as you said, ditto. Uh, there's a lot of information that's going to be very similar to the, what was presented already. But, um, you know, I wanted to start by similar to, to Jeff and Chad, thanking everybody that participated. I was like a sponge out there because, again, coming from a, you know, a North Dakota, Colorado kind of background, we don't have a lot of coasts, so I'm soaking all this stuff up and trying to understand some of the issues associated with the coast. And it was, you know, I'm listening as well as trying to interact, and it's, you know, it keeps me, keeps me going. And I was, uh, you know, certainly learning a lot this morning. Um, Dave Fowler mentioned something that it's a bit of an analogy, and, I'll, and I thought I would use it too. You know, we, there's a lot of conflicts not only in you know, the riverine flooding, but certainly in the coastal floodplains as well. And those social and economic conflicts continue to exist. And he said one of the analogies that we should use is we should have the, the music from Jaws playing in the background, and the mayor's out on the beach with the sheriff, and the mayor is, you know, the sheriff is telling him, you got to get these people off the beach. You gotta, there, there's danger out there. There's danger out there. And the mayor's not saying anything about you have to remove these. He's saying in a nice but firm manner, do you understand the economic issues associated with moving all these people in this holiday weekend and what it's going to do to the community and your neighbors and all this stuff? Well, that's kind of the conflict that we're talking about here. I mean, we, we have social and political and risk issues. And I mean, in the background, if we're having the, the Jaws movie playing and we're talking about this, I think we get it. And I think that's not a bad analogy. So I know there's a conflict out there, and maybe that's what you, you start the program with. Um, having said that, um, I wanted to, much of what was already talked about, um, we talked about as well. There was a few points I want to make. So on the, you know, we started with a real good discussion on the management approaches and opportunities and impediments to achieving this holo holistic coach approach. And you know, I want to touch on a couple of these and then probably go on right down to the agenda items. But I wanted to get a couple of these issues out. Um, you know, there was a comment about, you know, we need to manage locally, but think globally. In other words, we may be managing, um, you know, for what's happening on the coast, but we have to make sure we make that connection. And that connection is not just coastal driven, it's, you know, the, you need to expand that horizon a little bit. And we need to understand, even in interior states, that what's happening out on the coast is you know, impacting us as well. And I think we need to use that as a focus. And I think that's a, a, an understanding that we can relay through some of the outreach uh, programs that we're going to talk about, you know, and we've already talked about as well. There was a discussion also about a good amount of data already exists out there. Uh, USGS title data, for example, and that we're not commuting, communicating this information to create actions. And how can we use this technology to advance the cause and bolster this network? And I think that's an important aspect of it as well. There is a lot of resources out there. We aren't accessing them all. And I think we need to compile that information. And I think the group pretty much was in agreement that we need to start you know, connecting more often with people that do have a lot of this data and then use that in our planning process. Um, there was some discussion as well about we need to implement uh, BW12 actuarial rate structures with no backsliding due to political pressure. That was talked about at length during our session and the benefits and, and certainly the pain, and there was some pain, and I think Chad alluded to that, of BW12 and you know some of that pain that comes with you know perhaps backsliding due to the political pressure. So there's a lot that we need to consider when, it, when we're talking about BW12 as well. Um, we also had mentioned within our group that perhaps we need to consider that all floodplain managers within all communities, whether it be coastal or interior, need to be CFM and perhaps tie that to some kind of CRS credit rating. That was a consideration. We've talked about it at, at, at the state level within Colorado, trying to make that a requirement. Uh, I know that New Mexico, for the most part, has moved that direction, et cetera. But there's lots of you know, conversation about that. And perhaps that helps us move along and understand the issues a little bit better. But that was one of the comments that was made during our discussion. 
Another point that was mentioned was that we need to link coastal erosion and uh, with coastal flooding and use, you know, integrate more of a geomorphic concept and approach to the entire administration of this, um, you know, this coastal zone flooding, interior flooding, etc. cetera. Uh, it, it has to in involve more processes uh, than what we're doing now. And I think, you know, erosion is an issue. The geomorphic complexity associated with that is an issue. And then we talked about geomorphic compatibility. And I think that we have to make sure that we understand that you, you know, we're, a, we're in a natural system here. And in this natural system, if we think we understand what's going on, Mother Nature has a really wonderful way of showing us how much we don't know. I mean, and, and so we're babies in the process. And, and with that in mind, from a geomorphic context, I think we have to understand that as well that every action, there is a reaction to that. And if we understand that, maybe we try to integrate that somehow into the management and planning activities that we um, are doing with respect to the coastal zones. Um, there was another comment that I wanted to touch uh, a bit on, uh, and that Dale mentioned this, that the main impediment to sustainable and resilient coastal actions is money. And then it, it's not program funding, but local, coast, uh, local coastal money in the coastal area, too much financial interests on the coast, et cetera. We, you know, an additional discussion about that indicated that the past hurricanes have brought out the worst behavior. It's all slanted towards aiding redevelopment for financial purposes uh, versus doing resilient things. Kind of like that shark issue that we're talking about. The same conflict exists in that regard. Um, let's see. Um, oh, there was a lot of discussion as well, and I know that Matt talked about this. Perhaps it's time that we need to tell the truth. You know, we need to post, you know, post disasters. We need to focus on truth telling. You know, there's a lot of information that is put out. And it's slanted one way or the other, but shouldn't we focus on telling the truth about what's going on following the disaster? Shouldn't we focus on some of the metrics? Not some, but all of the metrics associated with it. And we feel like learning and the public needs to know, and if we're going to use outreach as a tool, then I think we need to look at telling the truth following some of this post-disaster. And use that then as a planning tool for you know what we're doing going forward. But we need to tell the truth a little bit more and not uh, and, and I think that's an education process that starts, at, you know, probably with the politicians, with the practitioners, and it moves right on down the line to, you know, telling the truth and getting out some of this outreach out to even, you know, children at, at, at the school age. We also need to add visual tools as, as an approach to getting the message out. We talked about how people learn visually. And most of us are visual types of people. And some of the tools that are being produced and the capabilities now, whether it be Facebook or any number of other ones, allow us to do that quickly. Uh, I was talking to Joanne. She showed me a YouTube um, presentation, a three-dimensional display that would really lays out a lot of great information relative to you know, what happens on the coast, how the, you know, the, the risks are, are assessed, how, what it looks like relative to the zone that you're in. And this type of information, we think and we believe, needs to be relayed to everybody uh, in that manner. And it can be utilized you know, for, from the very young to the very old, because it's very, uh, it's very accessible and it's very pertinent. Oh, there was a great comment. And, and um, you know, stand up if you said it. And I know who said it. Adam said it. It says, why don't we run FEMA like a business? That's a great comment. I thought, sure, it's, and, and you know, in that regard, um, the follow-on business, well, would that be like a Barclay Bank? Or would it, like, you know, we have to run it like a business that has the right types of truth-telling aspects of it again. So should we run FEMA like a business? Well, we know that was a comment that was made. It'll probably go into David's report. But, uh, but anyway, it was a great comment, and, and we, we had a, a bit of discussion about that. One of the items that we took a fair amount of time and discussed was we need to look at the community rating system utilized for disaster assistance and grants and, 
and for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers flood control formulas. And this would be similar to a CRS-based approach. And maybe we need to apply that um, a little bit more and, and at least consider looking at a CRS-based approach to flood disasters and disaster reduction as well. And then the flood payments that would come as a result of that. If you're an extremely resilient, flood resilient um, community, perhaps then you know you you get the benefits and the rewards. Now, having said that, there was some also some other discussion about the social aspects of that. And when you're looking at that, you have communities that may not have that capability when socially they're not able to move that direction. So I think we have to also consider that as well and figure out some ways to get some credits in that, you know, if, if we're moving in that direction. But um, I do believe it's worthy of consideration and discussion and I think that there was some good discussion, at least with our group, about moving forward in that direction. Having said that, I, you know, I'm going to move on to some of the um, action items that we had identified uh, from a policy technology standpoint. From a policy standpoint, um, we felt like we need to tie natural and beneficial functions and those items together with the floodplain. I think that was an important aspect of it, and we need to do a better job of trying to tie those two together. Uh, the flood hazard risks is, is certainly something that we focused on a lot, but we need to make sure that we, we incorporate the other action items as well as it, term, as it relates to natural and beneficial items. You heard me already talk about community-based insurance action. As, or I didn't talk about that, but we did have a lot of discussion about community-based insurance action maybe as a need. And we can look at communities uh, out there having their own insurance policies, et cetera. And maybe that's something that we need to consider and integrate into this. And I know that there's the uh, advantage and disadvantages and benefits, et cetera, associated with that. But maybe it's something that we should consider. There was a lot of discussion in the group, and I think there was a consensus of the group that this is not a bad idea. And it's something that we should move forward with. We need, I did talk about tying a CRS rating to the formula for all federal funding programs to avoid post-disaster rewards. That was what we were talking about previously. And we also, I heard from a couple after the group had ended that we need to recommend shorter defirm completion schedules. Um, certainly it's taken a long time. I'm, I'm not sure how to accomplish that right now, but I think if we could, I know that that was one of the items that was identified. From a policy standpoint, we need to follow and require the completion of FEMA's future condition study required in um, BW12. And I know that that's been talked about by the previous speakers, Jeff and Chad. We need to raise the national minimum standard building codes to require coastal A and V zone considerations to include one foot of freeboard. From a data standpoint, again, we need better data and, and the actions it takes to get the better data and incorporate that. We need to link coastal erosion with coastal flooding using a geomorphic concept and approach. We talked about that. That was became a recommendation of ours as an agenda item. From an outreach actions standpoint, again, better outreach is, is required at every level. Politicians, you know, down to the fifth and sixth graders and earlier, and I think we do that through some of the tools that we need to develop. And I think those tools, ex tools exist now, but I know we need to access them better and then create new tools as well. And again, visual outreach seems to be, you know, where we're heading, and, and I think that's a really good idea. So having said that, that was, you know, the items that we had identified. There was so much more that we talked about in there that I know I might have missed some of those action items. Uh, so within our group, if there's something that you feel, you know, that I've missed and we need to, to discuss at this point, by all means, you know, stand up and, and identify it. Is there anything? Yes. Yes, that's right.
Thank you. Uh, yeah, that was one I wanted. David, did you want to? Well, I just uh, was for clarification because uh, I actually walked into the room while I was going on and heard it later. But uh, I'm wondering if you have any recommendations that we that we really do a more broad level uh, after action report. All of the agencies that are involved in disaster assistance do after action reports from their narrow perspective. Did we perform well? Uh, should we, could we have done it in a month sooner? Things like that. But the bigger question, uh, like with the Gallagher report, were how did we get where we are? What happened? And where does it lead? And what, what policies need to be looked at? So it was a broader type of report. An NTSB report might be, it could be either, but uh, it's, it's not <coughs> fairly narrow. I mean, you know, what went wrong and how do we, how do we fix it? I guess, and I, I guess, I, and I thank you for bringing that up. I, I know I had it in here, and, and pretty much, I think what we had concluded was that we need to. What does it take to do an independent study approach, and whatever that is, we need to try and do it. Right. So I think that was the focus and, and the recommendation that would have generated an action item. So and I believe um, the we did talk about the NTSB style approach, and I think that that was right on. So thank you. <coughs> 